This morning we're talking about the purpose of the church and we're talking about what it means to follow God. And that's really our word for today is to follow. Obedience or following God is a common theme throughout scripture, particularly for the people of God. In the book of Exodus, way back in the beginning of the Bible, Moses went up to a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, a message about what the people were supposed to do and how they could follow God. Exodus 19 says, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Many of us know, knowing the Old Testament, that hearing those words, again and again, the people of Israel continued not to follow God, but to disobey him. And yet we still read that God remains faithful to them. In fact, one day God planned to send his son to this world to die and to pay for our disobedience once and for all, so that we can receive salvation and forgiveness. In knowledge that we are Oh, disobedient and we do not follow God. Let's turn to a prayer of confession which will be on the screen and confess our disobedience towards him together. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we confess we have often failed to be an obedient church. We often fail to open our eyes and see where you are leading us. Even when we listen to your will, we find obedience to be hard. Because of this, we have broken your own. We have not loved your neighbor. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not acted in your name, but in our own interests. Forgive us, we pray, for from joyful obedience to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the end, it's not our disobedience which carries the full weight. Instead, it is God's faithfulness. And this is what Paul writes in Romans 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's not through our own power or our our own obedience. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ, our faithful God. In Christ alone, we have found salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to listen to the words of salvation as the choir sings this morning. 
We come into a time where we give our gifts to God. And our offering this morning, I think it's only for the general fund this morning. Let us give generously as God has given to all of us. Our scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. The word of the Lord. Be Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word. Send now your spirit into this place. Open our hearts and our minds to see what you are speaking and to live it faithfully every day of our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, everyone stand up real quick. Stomp your feet three times. Now everyone raise your hand. Another hand. Okay, now everyone sit down. <laughs> 
It's a cold fall day, and everyone's kind of taken a little bit to wake up this morning. But that's okay. That's okay. You read our passage this morning, and, and the words, hopefully you read them. And here's my question. And maybe, Tom, you want to put some of those words back on the screen if you can? Oh, the screen's up. Of course the screen's up. But if you remember from our passage, how many of these words did you see in our passage this morning? If you saw a word, shout it out. Did I hear? Serves. Serves was in there. Yep, serves. Pray. That was in there. Listens. Yep. Did I hear someone else? How about nourished? Proclaim. Proclaim. Here's my point. We have been talking about the purpose of the church for the last eight weeks. This is week nine. We have about three more weeks to go. And Ashley and I, as we've been doing this, we've taken a passage and used a word to explain the passage. All right? And that sort of creates this picture that in your mind that might be wrong. We, if you read Acts all the way through, all the way through, every chapter from chapter 1 all the way through 20, I think it's 29, I don't remember, that's a bad thing, but that's okay, um, you'll see these words appear again and again and again. Many of them are in chapter after chapter. The word proclaim, I think, is almost in every chapter in the book of Acts. In other words, while we've been going through these word by word, chapter by chapter, the reality is that these words are all over the place. The early church is always praying, being transformed, listening, unifying, proclaiming boldly, being nourished, and serving. The church, the early church, is always doing these things. They're doing these things all the time. And our passage this morning really shows that. They didn't pick or choose which purpose they were going to do and when. They did them all at once. Look at Acts 13, our passage this morning. They are praying together. They are listening to God. They're being nourished. Paul and Barnabas are being nourished when the hands are being placed upon them. God is speaking, so Paul and Barnabas begin a missionary journey to the Gentiles. You could say that's unifying. You have proclaiming boldly, serving. Our passage is five verses long, and you have almost every word that we've gone over the last eight weeks found in it. We are learning what God calls us to do as a church. What is the purpose of the church? And the reality is the church is called to do all these things you see behind me all the time. We are always proclaiming boldly. We are always listening. We are always being nourished. We are always praying. We are always serving. We are always, or should always, be unified by common belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when a church is doing all these things, then I believe the church will be as dynamic as the church we read about in the book of Acts. Notice I said church. Because we are all called as part of the community to do all these things. Every one of us is called to do every one of these things. However we can with whatever gifts we have. So as we get into the home stretch, we have a few more words to go. About four. I want us to remember that each of these words are important. And guess what? We are all called as a body of believers to do each of these things always. And that includes our word for today, which is the word follows. I always think I'm going to mess this up as I stick a word on. The word follows. I don't think it's very hard to see the word follow in our passage this morning. We open up Acts 13 and the leadership of the church, the prophets, the teachers, they're in Antioch and they're praying. They are listening to God. That word listens is very important in our passage, by the way. Once again, we're called to see the churches to listen and to pray. 
And guess what happens when they do these things? God speaks. Because that's what you, God does when you listen and you pray. God speaks. And he tells this church to set apart for him Barnabas and Paul for his purpose. He's going to have them do something very different. So what do they do? They do exactly that. In our passage, we see the church following God's will. Or you could say the church is, the purpose of the church is to follow the will of God. You can say it many different ways. But it is clear. We as a Christian community are called to follow wherever God speaks. Paul and Barnabas and and the leadership of the church, they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking and they follow that voice. Even as God is calling them to do something a little bit different. A little bit of background information. In Acts 13, the church is still growing. If you remember other sermons, you remember that in the book of Acts, the church starts off small and begins to grow. Geographically, actually. That's one way it grows. As you go through the book of Acts, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it encompasses most of the Roman Empire. And here we're starting to get bigger and bigger. The church is also growing in terms of people. Just a few chapters earlier, Peter is sent to a Gentile, and he learns that the Gentiles are to be a part of the church. So no longer is it just Jews who become Christians, now it's everyone who can become part of the church. So the church is growing. But the church has grown through people proclaiming boldly, but more or less as people are living out their lives, the church is growing. But now God is calling Paul and Barnabas to do something a little bit different. Acts 13 is the beginning of the first missionary journey of Paul. He is going to send them into the middle of nowhere to the island of Crete to preach the gospel. This is the beginning of the church becoming a missionary church. The church has never ceased to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and has expanded through persecution and other means, but now Christians are going to be sent somewhere with a specific mission to spread the gospel. Acts 13 is the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. He will go on four missionary journeys in total. He will begin churches in Greece, Turkey, Syria. He will begin church, help churches in Rome, He will cultivate churches in different places all throughout the Roman Empire. In other words, Paul and Barnabas and a lot of other people are going to go out and do wonderful things in the name of Jesus Christ. Through Paul and many of the early missionaries, the church will grow in leaps and bounds. And they do this, the church grows because Paul and Barnabas follow the will of God here in Acts 13. God will do wonderful things through them. The church is called to follow the will of God. We are called to follow God's will. And God can do wonderful things when we do. That's the first thing I want us to see in our passage. God calls us to follow his will. And when we do, when God shows us his will... That means God is wanting to do something through us. When God shows us his will, it means he wants to do something through us. I think sometimes we underestimate God. Um, I do. And yet, through people like us, normal people, God has transformed the lives of sinners. Through normal people like us, God can speak the gospel into the darkest place and has spoken the gospel into the darkest places in this world. Through people, God has found homes for orphans. Through people, God has broken the cycle of sin and brings peace in the middle of violence. Through people like us, called to do his will, God has done incredible things in this world. I could have told a thousand stories to illustrate my point, and I'm not going to. I'm just going to say, when you hear God speak and when you feel God prompting and leading, it means God wants to do something through you. Never doubt the power of God 
and what he can do through someone like you, through people and churches like ours who follow his will. When God speaks, listen. Listen. And that is, of course, that goes into my second point. The first point is we have to believe God can do wonderful things through us. But we also have to hear God speak. Uh, the word listen and, and follows are really two sides of the same coin. They are. We can only really follow God when we first listen to him. And I cannot say loud enough how important it is for us to listen to God. God still speaks in this world every day. He still speaks through scripture. He still speaks through prayer and fasting. He still speaks through the Holy Spirit inside every believer here. God can speak through the Holy Spirit in you right now. And yes, sometimes God speaks in such a way there might actually be a voice. That does happen. God speaks. And the church has to listen for God. Individuals are, of course, called to listen to God's will, but certainly a church has to as well. I cannot say how important that is. How do we know what God is calling this community to do? Unless the elders and the deacons and the pastors pray and listen. Or the worship teams or the fellowship team. How do they do the work of God unless they too listen and see where God is leading? A church, everyone who belongs to a church needs to have ears open. This church in Antioch never would have sent Paul and Barnabas unless they had heard from the Holy Spirit. And look what they did. They listen and they follow. And Paul and Barnabas go and they do wonderful things in the name of Jesus Christ. A church, before it follows God, needs to see where it, God is leading it. And that does take a group of Christians willing to listen with open eyes and ears for God's will. And I say group because I think group is very important. Um, I have a pet peeve in life. Actually, if you ask Ashley, I have a lot of pet peeves in life. Um, probably just like everyone else in this world. Uh, but one of them is this. I have been part of churches and church communities where a single voice dominates the discussion. And I've been part of churches and church communities where I've seen the person appeal, God is leading us to do this. And it's not like I disbelieve people. I don't try to disbelieve people, but my next question has always been, how do you see God's leading? You say God is leading, how do you know? There's a passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, and this is what it says. Do not quench the spirit. I love that thing. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. In other words, when people speak in the name of God, do not treat them with contempt. But test them all. I always thought that was such a beautiful passage. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. There's a reason why Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. God often works and speaks in communities of believers who share the same spirit of God. He often chooses multiple people to communicate his will through. A community exists also to test what is from God. To make sure that a single voice doesn't dominate, but that God's will always does. That's why churches are important. As a group, we are called to listen and discern what is from God. But we're also called to follow what we hear. And that means having courage, and that's my third point. We're called to believe that God can do wonderful things. We're called to listen and also discern, but we're also called to have courage. And that's what we as a church are called to do. Some of you might wonder why I use the word follows instead of obey. Um, I could use the word obey. The church, of course, is to obey God. 
Obey and obedience sometimes seem harsh to people, or at least many people find those words harsh. But I didn't choose follows just to be politically correct. Um, Follows actually seems to me to be a better word. In the book of Acts, before Christians were called Christians, does anyone remember what Christians, does anyone know what Christians were called before they were called Christians? I heard someone say it. Followers of the way. I always thought that's a, a beautiful, beautiful terminology. We were called the people of the way or the followers of the way because we follow the path of Jesus Christ. We're called to open our ears and eyes and listen and see the will of God. Test if we need to, but we're always called to follow God. But sometimes, even when we see God's will and we know where he's prompting us, we don't always follow. We don't always follow the path that God has set forth for us to go down. There's a scene... Um, in Beauty and the Beast. Yes, the Disney movie, Beauty and the Beast. It's one of my favorites. Early on in the movie, Belle's father has his contraption on the back of a horse and he's taking it to the fair. And he gets lost. And he comes to a fork in the road. And on one side, there is this beautiful path. I think birds are even singing. It's this wonderful path. And on the other side is this dark and foreboding, gloomy path. And he wants to go down this one. Even the horse doesn't want to go down this path. And yet he still does. And people, I remember thinking, oh, what, what a, a stupid choice to go down that path. But because he went down that path, he met the beast. And all the events of the movie happen. And there is a wonderful ending to the movie. Life with God can be that sometimes, too. Sometimes we're called to go down those paths that look dark and foreboding. Sometimes God is calling us as a church or individuals to do things we'd rather not do. In our passage, Paul is called to the first of four missionary journeys. He will do wonderful things in the name of God, and yet Paul will suffer for it. He will be whipped multiple times. He will be shipwrecked three times. He will be imprisoned for his beliefs also multiple times. He will be mocked and accused. He will start riots. He will be run out of town. He will be forced to hide for his life. And finally, he will face death after a prison sentence in the city of Rome. Paul faces all these things in order to be faithful to God's calling in our passage, and yet Paul is still faithful to God's calling. Even in our passage, you get a sense that these church leaders in Antioch, they know that God is calling Paul and Barnabas to do some really difficult things because the first thing they do after hearing God speak is to lay their hands on Paul and Barnabas to nourish them and encourage them before they leave. They are strengthening these two guys for whatever lies ahead. And this is not the only place in the book of Acts where you have God calling someone to follow him, and it's going to be difficult. A few weeks ago, we talked about Peter, who received a vision to meet someone from a, a, a Gentile. Paul obeyed, even though there was enormous pressure not to, and he had to defend himself to the Christian community after he did that. Stephen was under enormous pressure to stop proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Stephen refused even though he was stoned for it. There's many places in the book of Acts and in the Bible itself where people are called to follow God, and it will be difficult. And yet, wonderful things happen because of it. We as individuals and as a church are called to follow the will of God. We're called to open our ears and our eyes. We're called to listen and test what is true. And then we are called to have the courage to walk down paths that God is calling us to walk down. Paths that might be hard. Paths that might call us out of comfort. Comfort. 
paths that might call us to do things that we don't find easy, that will stretch us, that will make us uncomfortable instead of easy. And, pa- and yet, sometimes even God calls people down paths that lead to their death. And I can't blame God for that either because my life is not my own. Our lives are not our own, but they belong to God. We're called to listen, and we're called to follow. And sometimes that means being courageous and doing things that not, do not look easy. As a church, um, the church leadership, the council, elders, deacons, teams, we're talking about the future of the church. A few weeks ago, we took surveys, which the council is also talking about, and teams are starting to look at the results. And one of the things I was very glad about when I saw the results of the survey was this. I saw in the many consistent answers ways in which God is speaking to this church. And that's the way it should be. As a church, it begins with the will of God. It's not what we want, it's what God wants. And we have to listen as leaders, as congregants, as, as parishioners, as, as a church. We first listen to where God is leading all of us. And then we have to speak where God is leading us, test if necessary, so that it is in us, it's always God. And then sometimes we have to have the courage to follow God too even if that isn't easy, even if God is calling this church to do something that might stretch us all. But may God always give us hearts of obedience to see his will and make us wholeheartedly willing and able to follow him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... We pray that we have open hearts, open ears, to hear your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we see where you are moving and prompting and leading. And Lord, may we have the courage to follow you. It is not us as a community. It is about where you desire us to go. Help us to remember that every day. And Lord, as we as a church start to look towards the future, above all, may we be faithful to your will and scripture, faithful to your spirits as, he, as you speak in this church now. So that it's not about us, it is always about you. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm assuming we have a song of response. I do not have a bulletin on me this morning. Let's let's stand and sing, Speak, O Lord.